Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, my name is Donna Counts. I'm a policy analyst at the Council of State Governments in Lexington, Kentucky. I want to welcome you to, to the CSGE Academy webcast on workforce development, how states are innovating with WIOA. Uh, states are re-engineering their workforce development systems as a result of the workplace innovation Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. The state plans have been submitted and approved. Now state workforce officials are in the process of implementing their plans. We wanted to use this webinar as a way to share state strategies that are working and to offer new ideas as we all move forward. Next slide. Okay. We have some interesting discussions on the agenda today. Here's a look at the agenda. First, we'll hear from uh, Secretary Jim Rapowski, Assistant Secretary in the Maryland Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation. Uh, Secretary Rapowski will share how Maryland's workforce system has embraced WIOA as an opportunity to improve services. Uh, hallmarks of Maryland's implementation include extensive focus on collaboration across state departments and with local agencies, as well as the initiation of some new programs. Next, we're going to hear from Amy Diller, who is heading Iowa's Registered Apprenticeship Program. The U.S. Department of Labor has identified Iowa as a leader in supporting the Registered Apprenticeship model of work-based learning. Ms. Beller is going to tell us how Iowa is collaborating with agencies across the state to promote registered apprenticeships as a strategy as they implement WIOA. And then finally, we will be hearing from Sherry Moses with the Reentry and Employment Program at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Sherry will discuss how people with criminal records can be served by the workforce development system and identify funding opportunities to serve both adult and youth populations. So after that, we will have our presenters respond to your comments and questions. So if during the presentation, if you have a question for any of our presenters, you can type it in the GoToWebinar interface at any time. We will collate these questions here in the and then we'll go through the questions at the end. And so now we'll start with our first presenter. Um, Secretary Rapowski is the Assistant Secretary in the Maryland Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation. Prior to serving in his current position, Jim served for eight years as a Corporate Director for Workforce Development for Constellation Energy Nuclear Group. Jim also served as Assistant Secretary of Commerce and was also a member of the Maryland House of Delegates for three four-year terms. Jim, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, Jim Repkowski with the Maryland Department of Labor. Uh, I've got a few slides to share with you about how we tackled uh, both the writing of our plan as well as the implementation of the new federal act. And on each slide, I just try to highlight what the takeaway. And on slide number one, the takeaway is, is a workforce system. I can't say that I invented this term, but we probably under WIA, the workforce yeah, I've even forgotten the acronym it's so long ago, Workforce Investment Act, uh, we had lots of silos of excellence. Uh, what we wanted to do in Maryland is actually create a workforce system, uh, taking away those silos, breaking down the barriers between agencies. Next slide. And what I would define it as is the perfect storm. So let me take you back to 2015 and what the perfect storm was in Maryland. You had a new federal law that was passed in 2014 with a two-year implementation period. What you also had in Maryland was a changing of a political administration. Uh, the prior governor had two, two terms totaling eight years. Uh, governor Hogan was elected, uh, which meant that there were kind of new people brought onto the team, a transition plan as any administration does. And it really created that, that perfect storm because there was a political will to do something differently in, in Maryland. And I, I'll have to say I, I kind of leveraged, uh, now in my background you heard I was a member of the state legislature and, and 
a member of the Department of Commerce, and, and now I'm here at the Department of Labor. Been around a few years and created a few connections and uh, really wanted to leverage that. And I was also on the transition committee for this particular agency and heard from a lot of career professional staff of the opportunities that the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act presented, not just with this agency, but other agencies. And in that transition, I also heard where there was a reluctance from certain agencies working together. Uh, your customers will impact our performance. We don't serve your customers because of this reason or that reason. Uh, and it was a real opportunity for us to say, okay, we're going to approach this differently and, and uh, use kind of the new bully pulpit of the new administration, if I could put it that way. So what you see in our workforce plan is that uh, three agencies working together that all had workforce components uh, but didn't really seamlessly work together. And that's the Maryland Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation. We had authority over Titles I and III. Uh, fortunately, we also had Title II uh, because if, if we recall Secretary Tom Perez, uh, early on in his uh, career, he was also Secretary of Maryland Department of Labor. And uh, in 2009, he brought both correctional education and adult education from the State Department of Education to the, the Maryland Department of Labor, integrating it into the workforce system. And as we saw with the passage of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, he made the rest of the uh, United States do the same thing. So for the first time, we had a, a workforce plan that represents uh, three state agencies, State Department of Education, State Department of Human Services, and of course, Maryland's Department of Labor. Uh, we worked that through the Governor's Workforce Development Board uh, and got our plan approved. Next slide. Uh, the, the real focus of uh, the Hogan administration in particular is customer service, government efficiency, and of course meeting the needs of all businesses in Maryland as well as job seekers. So the takeaway from this slide is, is just look at the cover of our state plan. The cover of the state plan, regardless of, if you read, don't read the 300 plus pages of the state plan. If you look at the cover, it demonstrates what we were trying to do in Maryland. It represents uh, the Maryland Department of Labor the State Workforce Development Board, the Department of Human Resources. Our local directors have an organization that has since changed its name from when we printed this slide. It was the Workforce Investment Network. They're now the Maryland Workforce Association. It's the association of the 12 local Title I directors. They're on the state plan. Never before have they been on the state plan. And the Division of Rehabilitative Services. It's all about all the different stakeholders in one combined state plan. Uh, we also put a focus on people before performance. I mentioned that in my opening comments that if the workforce system serves TANF customers, it's going to take longer, they have more barriers, it's going to impact the workforce system's performance. Uh, we really wanted to take an approach that um, we want, if we serve the customer and do what's right by the customer, performance will follow. It was a little controversial because folks will say, you can't forget about performance. We need to get our federal dollars in. Again, we truly believe that if we serve the individual needs of the business and our customers, that, that performance will, will follow. But we wanted to ask the tough questions. Why aren't we serving that person? Should we be spending more time uh, with that individual? So it really set a course of, of how we were approaching it. In fact, I, I used to tell a story about when I started here in 2015 working with other state agencies, they said it'll be a cold day and you know where um, before these various different agencies work together. Well, I'm happy to report that we've, we're, we have arrived at a cold day uh, because these agencies are, are working together much more cooperatively. Next slide. The key is collaboration. Uh, when I came into this job, uh, we put together uh, some working groups of how we were going to tackle the new challenges under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Some of those work groups um, continued on, but after we adopted the state plan, we re-looked at that and said, okay, uh, what do we need to do? One of the key pieces was we needed to make sure that the state agencies and local partners and other partners remained engaged, and we, uh, we still meet monthly on what we call the WIOA alignment group. What we found is that we can get in a room and assistant secretary in this division can talk to an assistant secretary in this division, but when you get out into the field 
unless all of the team and all the folks out in the field are aligned and speaking from the same song sheet, uh, even if the leaders of an organization agree, if the folks out in the field aren't on the same message, uh, we're not going to be successful. So uh, another key point is collaboration and transparency. Uh, we've approached this whole process as doing what's right for our customers and doing what's right for Maryland. If I were asked what one of our challenges were, well, sometimes uh, while we love our federal partners, uh, they'll be free to admit sometimes their guidance doesn't come in advance of us as a state needing to make a decision. So working collabor collaboratively with our, with our federal partners, uh, we heeded their advice when they said if there's the lack of federal guidance, don't get hung up on, well, let's wait until it comes. Do what you think is right for your system and do what is right for the state of Maryland. And I think that was a key part of our success. And let me tell you, working with some of the locals and some of the other partners that will say, well, we don't want to do anything until we get federal guidance. Well, as many folks in the system will say, the federal guidance came, but in some regards, it came after the product was due. So uh, the, the, the secret to our success here in Maryland thus far has been, again, doing what we think is right for our system, even if the federal guidance wasn't available. And the good news is, is when the federal guidance has come, uh, is generally uh, we haven't had to change things much and we've been ahead of the schedule. Um, it's also going back to creating a system. As I mentioned, uh, when Secretary Perez was the Maryland Secretary of Labor, we had the luxury of already having Title II programs integrated in the Workforce Division. But over the last uh, two years, we've also brought in the Senior Community uh, Service Employment Program that was housed in the Department of Aging. We brought that into our workforce system and brought it over to our department. The eligible training provider list was administered by our Higher Education Division. We brought that back into our Workforce Development Division. Uh, we have the Apprenticeship Program, which was here at Maryland's Department of Labor, but it was in a different division. Uh, by passing a law, we brought them into the workforce system, uh, effective October 1 of 2016. We've also had the uh, opportunity to participate in some national policy academies. Um, one was the Health and Human Services Systems to Family Stability National Policy Academy. Uh, and, and what that has led us to is a, a conversation beyond our federal performance guidelines that we have to have under WIOA. We, we put together a, a, a benchmarks for success document that really gives us a management tool. Really have to think about it separately from what we have to do to function as a system and get our funding from our, our federal funding partners. But really asking the difficult decisions are, are we making an impact in that customer's life? And are we improving their ability to sustain their family? So. We've, we've done a few things uh, that are very collaborative with other agencies and, and brought on as many partners. Um, we have a, a distribution list of over a thousand people that have willingly signed up uh, to an email address to get information about how we're transforming our workforce system. Um, and you know it's impressive that that many folks willingly sign up and, and want to know what's going on in our system. Next slide. I briefly touched on it. Uh, but I do want to talk about, and I know the next speaker is going to talk more about apprenticeships, but effective October 1st, we did transfer the Office of Apprenticeships uh, from the Division of Labor and Industry to the Division of Workforce Development and Adult Learning that I'm currently in, and that has been transformative. Uh, while they're in the same department, as you all know, there are silos of excellence within each and any bureaucratic agency. Um, but apprenticeship is a workforce tool, and it belongs to be, it should be integrated with the workforce system. Uh, since that time, in the last six months, we've been able to triple the staff with the encouragement of uh, an Apprenticeship USA grant uh, that we received from the U.S. Department of Labor. We went from three to nine staff. Uh, we surveyed all of our registered apprenticeship programs, and none of them were on the eligible training provider list. Uh, we have contacted every one of the registered apprenticeship programs, and we now have 14 registered apprenticeship programs uh, on our eligible training provider list. Um, we've had our first non-traditional uh, apprenticeship uh, careers in healthcare. 
um, that were passed or that were passed by our apprenticeship and training council in November. And just this morning, Maryland had its first competency-based um, program passed through our apprenticeship and training council. Um, the occupation was environmental care supervisor. Um, it's a kind of an interme intermediary is the sponsor who has benefited from Apprenticeship USA dollars. And the employer uh, is the Maryland healthcare system led off by Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, employing these individuals. Um, I had mentioned, again, the opportunity to grow in non-traditional in industries such as cybersecurity, information technology, and, and digital and social media. So we've really seen a robust development um, by bringing the apprenticeship program into the workforce development system, uh, we're seeing growth in the number of apprentices here in the state of Maryland. Uh, and again, thanks to the investment of our federal partners. Last program, next slide. Last program that I will highlight is, uh, again, what we are driven to be in terms of being innovative, being industry driven, and provide workforce solutions that work for our employers. Uh, Maryland is happy to be a nationally recognized uh, uh, sponsor of a program called Earn Maryland, stands for Employment Advancement Right Now, and uh, we are currently in the third year of that program, and we have over 40 different partnerships and over 650 businesses involved. Uh, the neat part and the takeaway of this particular program, because it's industry driven, um, is we did a return on investment study and, and we realized that the average return when you're investing in training is about $3.41 for every dollar. And this is a state-driven program. We're not using federal funds for this program. This is an investment that the state of Maryland is receiving. When we looked at the return of inv on investment, uh, we're receiving almost $15 for every $1 invested in this program. Uh, the program has been so very successful that our regular $4 million appropriation has turned into an $8 million appropriation where we have gotten some money for what we're calling Green Earn, uh, Tier 1 Renewable Energies, and we have also gotten an additional $3 million influx, influx for cyber-related partnerships. Next slide, which is my last one. Uh, simply has uh, my contact information here. There's probably a, a lot more I could say, but I'm happy to answer questions during the end. Uh, my takeaway slide is collaboration, engagement of stakeholders. While engaging stakeholders and bringing them uh, on board early in the process can sometimes be cumbersome, I can assure you that the, the benefit of getting all the stakeholders at the table, taking the feedback seriously, having public comment periods, all relates for a, a better product. And the last I would say is that we're putting everything into policy. You can do a lot, but unless you create a sustainable system by having policies and procedures that document what you're doing and what you should be doing, um, every change of administration or change of assistant secretaries or, or change of staff, um, you'll end up with something different. So that's been an important part of our success here in the state of Maryland. Thank you, Jim. That uh, sounds like you've got a lot going on, um, a lot of uh, dynamic program. Uh, please uh, stay with us if you can. I think you're planning on it, and I'm uh, sure that there will be questions for you at the end of the webcast. Uh, and again, anyone, if you have questions, uh, please go to the GoToWebinar interface, and you can type those in, and we'll ask them at the end. Uh, now I want to move to our next speaker, it's Amy Beller. Ms. Beller spent the first 10 years of her career working for U.S. Senator Tom Harkin, where she performed various constituent and outreach services. She also spent two years developing the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement at Drake University. In December of 2016, she moved to the Iowa Workforce Development as the Registered Apprenticeship Coordinator. And there, she assists in the management of the Apprenticeship USA Accelerator and State Expansion Grants program. So, uh, Amy, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Donna, and thank you for having us on today. Um, uh, Iowa Workforce Development made a commitment uh, back in last fall when we received the Apprenticeship USA State, Expan um, State Expansion Grant and Accelerator Grant 
to bring on a program coordinator to um, be specific within registered apprenticeship to help aid um, the foundation of programs and to grow the footprint of registered apprentices um, and integrate within uh, the workforce system. And uh, thanks to our partners with the Office of Apprenticeship, um, we have a great foundation in Iowa, and we just want to expand upon the foundation that we have currently. Uh, just like Marilyn said, collaboration is the key. When I came on in December, I started talking with members of our, of our staff at, uh, within the Iowa Works Office, which is the American Job Center here in Iowa, along with our Iowa Workforce Development Offices, um, individuals, along with uh, our partners, um, our WIOA partners. And what I learned was that we needed integrated statewide training to kick off um, our registered apprenticeship program um, throughout our WIOA partnership. Uh, throughout uh, March, April, and May, we have trained over 200 WIOA partner staff, which include adult basic education, IBO vocational rehab, uh, Title I directors, business service team members, I will work, um, I will work membership team, and I will work force development administration staff. Um, during these three-part trainings, we had basically round one, we had uh, an, a registered apprenticeship 101. So we were all talking the same language and having the same goals and knowing what actually made up um, registered apprenticeship. And then we went around and we talked about how we could integrate registered apprenticeship um, within our uh, WIOA program. So really talking about um, how do we um, really make uh, the case to the individuals that come into our one stops every day and talking with them about what makes a registered apprenticeship program and how they would be able to, um, to sign up for a program or to look. This, so the round two, we talked about reporting because reporting was a struggle at the beginning and now we're kind of hitting that over um, the barrel and we're, we're really doing a great job on, on talking about how many programs we're, we're touching and how many individuals we're touching. And we also had interactive pitches that uh, individuals that were more on our business service team would talk about how they would do a first round meeting to business. And then individuals that touch job seekers, they were having uh, pitches to how they would talk and introduce registered apprenticeship to the job seeker side. And during that, that second round, we had our WIOA, uh, WIOA partners from Department of Education and Voc Rehab um, play an intricate part of how we would be integrating their participants and their business service team members um, in, in the mix of how we would be uh, creating a system-wide approach. Then our third round, we are doing in-depth training of district points of contact within our Iowa Works team on how do we create standards and how do we loop in between our job seeker side of the house and the business side of the house and having those points of contact be our points of contact for the agency amongst our WIOA partner staff. Slide, please. Then we talked about an integrated process of how do we look at our Iowa Works offices and our, our program coordinators on how do we, um, how, do, how does our, our Iowa Works team actually hand off all the pro, um, programs to myself? And we've worked hard on getting the handoff process um, really seamless, and we have basically a three-page checkoff sheet that we have for our work, um, our, our business side of the house and our job seeker side of the house um, to making sure that we have uh, information that we know who is touched by either the grant or by um, just everyday registered apprenticeship activities. Then our job seeker and our business service team, like I said, they have a point of contact for each individual office. So within our office, we are able to talk um, amongst the job seeker side and the business team side and talking about what openings we have versus what um, job seeker, seekers are coming in and want to be looking at registered apprenticeship as their next career option. And then when we hear of a business having openings, then we're able to talk to our job seeker side of the house and saying, hey, we have, we have a couple of um, positions that these businesses want to fill. Do we have credible candidates? So really making sure that we're integrated throughout um, and having those streamlined services, we, we're really trying to make the best fit forward for our, our individuals here in Iowa. And also with those job seeker side and the business um, service team members, those are the individuals that are really um, linking into our partners 
with um, Iowa, Iowa Vocational Rehab because they have a business, um, business service team member along with um, partner our uh, participants that we're linking our job seeker um, points of contact and our business service team members together. So we're basically one team working on registered apprenticeship within the state. Uh, we're also working at on handoff policies with Department of Education and talking about how our adult basic ed and how we can integrate them better into the registered apprenticeship um, ecosystem. And then our Iowa community colleges are also working together with us because they know that related training instruction, since that's one of the key five components of a registered apprenticeship program, um, that they know that they have to be at the table and work through some of the, uh, the concerns and some of the, the processes with us to ensure that we have great related training instruction um, here in the state of Iowa for our registered apprenticeship programs. Next slide. And once we did um, the integrated part within our Iowa Works Office, I started working with our program coordinators um, and really looking at um, learning about the programs, the requirements, the structure of the programs, and how we can really integrate um, services between all um, both Title I and Title III services uh, within the state. Uh, particularly, we're really looking at our incumbent worker policies across the state because um, what we've learned is that in Iowa, the registered apprenticeship program, um, some of the programs are able to bring in those entry-level uh, workers, but they, but they like to actually, um, they, they like to promote within and that promotion within, they'd like to have a registered apprenticeship program because um, they want to invest in those individuals because they know that they're going to stay. They've already had that relationship um, within their company. So we're really looking at expanding our incumbent worker policy uh, to encompass registered apprenticeship and how that looks in every region of the, of the state. We're also looking at seasonal um, farm workers because in Iowa, we are a big agricultural state that we're working with our outside partners. Um, we just had a conversation with Proteus today on they have um, different grant funding that they have used, and they're really looking at how to, um, how to refer individuals that are in their seasonal farm worker program into registered apprenticeship programs so we can expand the footprint within Iowa as well. So we're really looking at weaving um, programs together in order to create the best, um, best and skilled candidates for positions that are open within the registered apprenticeship um, programs in the state, and also really helping to, if, in, if a program doesn't exist, looking at getting individuals up and ready, and how do we um, use some of our workshops and our programs that we can create the best candidates possible um, for the programs when they're ready to hire those individuals. Next slide. One of the biggest, uh, the biggest priorities of our, our, of our Apprenticeship USA expansion grant and our registered apprenticeship program in general is to, be, is to building our partnerships. Um, Iowa is built upon partnerships because uh, you will move from place to place and you will always run into somebody that you know. You're six degrees of separation um, in the state. So we're really working at building up our partnerships with our WIOA partners. Like I said before, making sure that we have an integrated process. We have an outstanding relationship with our U.S. Department of, um, of Labor Office of Apprenticeship. Since we are an OA state or an Office of Apprenticeship state, um, they're the ones that actually register the programs. Um, but we really work through um, problems, concerns, uh, really looking at um, outreach opportunities with them and making sure that we are on the same page and moving forward together since they've already blazed the way um, within registered apprenticeship in Iowa. Um, through the Office of Apprenticeship, we just want to be able to expand and give better um, job seeker candidates over to um, programs and having those uh, WIOA services wrapped around. Some other key uh, stakeholders within the state expansion grant and our registered apprenticeship programs um, in Iowa are, is our Iowa Economic Development Authority. Um, our Iowa Economic Development Authority uh, receives $3 million for, from the state legislature every year for registered apprenticeship program sponsors to use for training. And there is a formula that's created um, in order to receive those funds, um, but it helps with those training costs that occur. And the governor, Governor Branstad, and Lieutenant Governor Reynolds have been instrumental on in making sure that that uh, funding occurred. Um, it started in 2014, 
and it's continued on to date at, um, at the same funding. So we, we, we can't um, say enough how much our governor and our lieutenant governor is behind registered apprenticeship and our state legislature, um, because without them, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to be making inroads as we are today. Um, also, the Iowa Department of Corrections um, received um, some funding from our state um, expansion grant and has, has been one of the leaders in registered apprenticeship in our correctional uh, facilities today. They have 19 occupations and over 150 um, registered apprentices enrolled as of today. So they have an outstanding program and they, and they help to um, bring in our re-entering citizens in with great paying jobs and making those connections for individuals that go through the registered apprenticeship program. Um, other key st stakeholders were um, the Iowa Department of Education, the Iowa Association of Business and Industry, and our Iowa STEM Council um, is creating four new quality pre-apprenticeship programs within our STEM best schools. So an another uh, way that they're, they're leading the way. Next slide, please. The eligible training provider list, um, we're educating our registered apprenticeship sponsors on the ETPL list and how they become a part of the provider list. We're still working on informing all of our current um, registered apprenticeship sponsors on the ETPL list and the opt-out policy, but where uh, a lot of sponsors are excited about this opportunity and some are already currently on the list um, from prior, um, but we are uh, full scale ahead on making sure that our, TP, our ETPL list is um, great and able to be uh, completed with all of our sponsors on it. Also on our website we have um, our ETPL list is searchable. So um, a lot of the registered apprenticeship sponsors go on and they search that ETPL list um, right now for related training instruction um, and seeing if they can, uh, if they have any questions on the ETPL. Next slide. And the last thing I want to mention today is our Future Ready Iowa initiative, which Governor Branson and Lieutenant Governor Reynolds created um, in 2004 to help build Iowa's talent pipeline. Um, for careers today and tomorrow, uh, we had a middle skills gap that was uh, noted in 2014, and this was their answer to that middle skills gap to helping us push to have the goal of for a Future Ready Iowa initiative to have 70% of Iowans work Iowa workforce to have an education or training beyond high school by the by 2025. It's a very ambitious goal, and uh, the governor says that he wants us to be the most future ready state in the nation. And we know we can get there, and registered apprenticeship is an intricate um, tool in reaching our future ready Iowa goal because of the national um, occupational accreditation that uh, the program receives at the end. So we, are, we have um, registered apprenticeship on the mind um, throughout the state of Iowa, and it's at the forefront of our leaders uh, in the state. Next slide. Information if you have any further questions. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, again, if you do have questions, just type them in the uh, GoToWebinar interface and we'll get to those at the end. Um, now I want to switch to Ms. Sherry Moses with the Reentry and Employment Program at the Council of State Government Justice Center. Her work focuses on employer engagement, federal workforce policy, and correctional education. Uh, Ms. Moses has extensive experience in workforce development in the public and nonprofit sectors. She's developed the Illinois Reentry Employment Service Program, which helped more than 1,100 formerly incarcerated people find jobs in the first 18 months. So Ms. Moses, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, and thank you very much for inviting me to be in this webinar. Next slide, please. The Council of State Governments Justice Center is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We're primarily funded by the U.S. Department of Justice to provide technical assistance to all Second Chance Act grantees. We also work on a number of specific project areas that are of interest to the field. And reentry and employment is one of these project areas. We provide information and resources to the field through the online National Reentry Resource Center NRRC, a project of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice. 
Next slide, please. <clears throat> First, some background on the scope of incarceration and reentry in the United States. In 2014, one in 36 adults in the United States were under correctional control. About 10 million people are released from incarceration each year. And nationwide, 74 million adults have an arrest or conviction record. Now we know that cr a criminal record impacts someone's ability to find and maintain work. Men with criminal records account for about 34% of all non-working men ages 25 to 54. Next slide, please. The corrections and workforce development systems have their own goals, reducing recidivism for corrections and placing people in employment for workforce development. But because such a large percentage of the population has a criminal record, their goals overlap. Both systems prepare formerly incarcerated people for work, and both must make the most of limited time and resources. Next slide, please. WIOA mentions ex-offenders. We use the term people with criminal records as part of a list of people with barriers to employment, along with people with disabilities, people who are homeless, and others. States were required to include an analysis of their current workforce and how they're going to address barriers to employment in their WIOA plans that, that were submitted about a year ago. And we heard from the plan about Maryland. I'm going to discuss several specific areas areas where WIOA can support the employment of people with criminal records. Next slide, please. These areas are one-stop centers, also known as American Job Centers, correctional education, special initiatives, and youth programs. Next slide. One-stop centers. Most job seekers interact with WIOA through the one-stop centers that are located in communities across the country. Resources for the formerly incarcerated at one-stop centers may include staff with specialized training who can assist job seekers on how to discuss a criminal record in a resume or in a job interview, or can provide information on the work opportunity tax credit and the federal bonding program. Correctional reentry staff, such as parole and probation officers, regularly assist their clients in obtaining employment. The more they can refer clients to one-stop services and work in partnership with the one-stop staff, the more likely they will see better employment outcomes. It's also important to make sure that the one-stop centers encourage access for people with criminal records. Having brochures or signs aimed at people with criminal records in the one-stop resource room can let them know that they're welcome and that there are services for them. Requiring identification or dress codes can actually reduce access for people with criminal records. Next slide, please. Correctional educa education. We owe a Title II Adult Education Literacy, Section 225, includes a requirement that states provide correctional education. And there are eight allowable categories of services. And they're listed here, adult education and literacy, special education, secondary school, integrated education and training, career pathways, concurrent enrollment, peer tutoring, and transition services. Integrated education and training and concurrent enrollment refers to combining occupational skills training and basic skills education. Career Pathways refers to education and training that results in industry-recognized credentials that help students to advance over time. <clears throat> WIOA requires not more than 20% of the funds available to states for grants and contracts under Title II be used for correctional education. And this is a big jump from the 10% that was allowed under WIOA. We owe correctional education funds are distributed by the state rather than through local workforce boards. Some states fund through the community college systems system, others through corrections or the public school system. Next slide, please. Oh. Special initiatives. 
As under WIA, each governor can retain 15% of Title I funding for special initiatives and statewide programs. These funds can be used in several ways to support the employment of people with criminal records. They can be used to support, to expand successful programs. They can be used to adapt existing workforce strategies to the needs of people with criminal records. And they can be used to test innovative strategies, among other uses. Next slide, please. One example of a strategy that can be expanded is the Integrated Reentry and Employment Strategies, or IRIS model, developed by the Justice Center in a white paper released in 2013. The IRIS approach draws on research and best practices from both the corrections and the workforce development fields to ensure that people are connected to the most appropriate services at the right time in their reentry process. Next slide, please. The framework of the IRIS model is based heavily on RNR principles, or risk, need, and responsivity, to provide evidence-based guidance on who should be prioritized to receive interventions and help determine what needs those interventions should address in order to reduce reoffending. The IRIS pilot project was designed to test innovative approaches to reducing recidivism and increasing job readiness for people returning from incarceration and to identify successful strategies for integrating reentry and employment programming. The Justice Center is now in the second year of a three-year pilot testing IRIS in two sites, Palm Beach County, Florida and Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. The theory being tested is that by applying resources based on an assessment-driven referral process, recidivism and employment outcomes will improve. IRIS can be expanded to other communities using the 15% set aside. Next slide, please. WIOA for youth. Youth who drop out of school are 63 times more likely to be incarcerated than college graduates. Under WIOA, 75% of youth funds must serve out-of-school youth, which is an increase over WIA. Youth with criminal histories are a target group for both in-school and out-of-school youth under WIOA. Services for youth are more comprehensive than WIOA services for adults and involve work experience, training, and support services. Next slide, please. I would like to encourage everyone to register for our monthly NRRC newsletter at csgjusticecenter.org backslash subscribe. And please feel free to contact me if you have any further questions or if you would like to share your success in using WIOA to serve people with criminal records. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions from Ms. Moses, just uh, go to the go to webinar interface and we'll ask those in, in just a minute. Um, I, I want to, we've, we've got several questions already, but one that has come up was where people can get copies of the slides. We will send you a link at the end of this webinar and you'll be able to download the PowerPoint that we've gone through today. So um, I guess we're First, the first question we've received was wanting a little bit more information about the EARN Maryland program. Uh, Jim, can you expand on EARN Maryland, what it does? Certainly. Uh, EARN, EARN Maryland, again, is in its third year. It is a, an industry-led uh, program where we require a, an applicant for funding. It's funded around $4 million. Uh, an applicant can uh, get anywhere from fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars for their training program. We fund a number of nonprofits and community colleges uh, that have industry partners, and that's the real key to the EARN program. Uh, a training provider can come to us, and they must have five um, five businesses engaged in the project. If they if if the training provider comes without a business that is committed to hiring these individuals that receive the training, um, then the project is not funded. 
So it, that, that's why we really say that it is, it is industry driven um, because it's the industry coming and saying to, the, to us, the state who is funding these projects, that yes, we have a need for X number of welders and we commit that if you use this type of training platform or curriculum, we will hire X number of individuals from this program. Again, that's what's made uh, the program uh, so very successful is that uh, real focusing in on making sure there are business partners up front. It's kind of different or the complete opposite of the train and pray model, which is you fund a training program and you pray that there's a job afterwards. Uh, this, this particular program turns it on its head. If you go to our website um, for the State of Maryland Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation, uh, you can find all of the program documents uh, and requirements for the Earn Maryland program. I'm, and I'm sure there's a, a quick link. We just recently did a solicitation and uh, are issuing awards for the remainder of fiscal year 2017, and we will be issuing a new RFP in FY18 beginning July 1 for our green EARN program as well as our cyber EARN program. Okay. Um, we've got a number of questions related to that program, but I think I'm going to hold them to the end and maybe touch on some of the other subjects. Uh, in particular, one, one question is, are any of the programs targeting apprenticeships for people with disabilities as a non-traditional workforce, uh, and specifically individuals with intellectual disabilities? Um, for, for the EARN program, I don't believe so, but we did just receive a disability employment grant for the, from the USDOL, $2.5 million for the next three years, uh, and we are uh, very much focused on serving those with the most severest disabilities. Again, it was a partnership between the Maryland Department of Disabilities and the D Division of Rehabilitative Services through the Maryland Department of Education. And just a quick kind of note on that, uh, the workforce system, I will say, and some people get upset when I say, we really didn't do a good job in serving individuals with disabilities. And when we originally wanted to apply for this particular grant, uh, we did not initially listen to our partners from the Department of Disabilities and the Division of Rehabilitative Services. Someone that I, entities that I would think are subject matter experts, and we should be listening to them more. They pushed us to include in our grant serving those with the severest of disabilities and, and pushing the employment first model. Uh, and as a system, while we had a lot of career folks that say that's really not our niche, I as the division leader had to say, well, why can't we do this? Our partners are, are saying that this is the direction we should be taking. Let's go out on a limb with our partners and attempt to serve those with uh, more severe disabilities. And again, bring them into Maryland's workforce system. Amy, has Iowa been focusing or had any particular experience in disabilities and registered apprenticeships? Yeah, uh, through our Apprenticeship USA State Expansion Grant, one of our grant goals is to increase the individuals with disabilities uh, on the apprentice, uh, the apprentice side. Um, and right now, um, our baseline number was zero. So we are, we are needing to increase it by 10 individuals. And we are pairing up with Iowa Vocational Rehab with their um, TAP counselors, which are traditional assistant, uh, transition assistant program counselors. And they are talking with their participants, um, the individuals that are either in careers that aren't extremely happy with the careers that they are in, and individuals that are in high schools, uh, to pair them up with registered apprenticeship program sponsors um, to work through um, accommodations and um, the needs of the individuals with disabilities. So we're really trying to hit it off at the path and working directly with the participants on uh, the design of the programs. And we haven't designed a program yet, but we're in the early stages of creating the partnership. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question has to do with the um, criminal justice system and uh, the corrections. And in particular, are any of the programs used within prisons to prepare individuals for successful integration into the community? 
Yes, um, there are a number of programs in, in correctional facilities across the country that um, train people for, for good jobs. And I think um, Amy mentioned an apprenticeship program in, in the pr prisons in Iowa. And there are similar programs throughout the country. And I would just comment on behalf of the state of Maryland, we have 26 occupational programs behind the fence which prepare people for HVAC careers to carpentry to uh, a whole host of others, electrical maintenance, building maintenance, uh, as well as um, Office, uh, Microsoft Office. Uh, we have traditional uh, GED programs as behind the fence. Um, and in fact, we just recently, in terms of apprenticeship and all the pieces of the puzzle coming together were approached by the Pile Drivers Union uh, who wanted to put a, a, a welding program and a rigging program behind the fence. So we're going to partner with the Pile Drivers Union. They're going to bring some resources. Uh, we're going to use, we're going to leverage our Apprenticeship Innovation Fund, which is money that we designated from our $2 million USDOL Apprenticeship USA grant. We committed to putting 621000 of that back on the street to entities that wanted to create programs uh, that met industry need. And in this particular case, again, we're going to uh, put it in one of our pre-release centers uh, because we understand that the Pile Drivers Union here in Maryland between work in Maryland and D.C. is going to have a significant need for individuals with these skills. And we are going to uh, uh, develop individuals behind the fence uh, for these careers. And I'd like to add, one of the good things about the apprenticeship program is that there is a link with employers. Um, but it's important for the rest of the non-apprenticeship job training programs that there's a link with employers and a link to service providers outside the facility so that once people leave, they can get the services they need to help them find a job. And that's why the public workforce system is so helpful, but so necessary, including the one-stop centers. Okay. Um, here's another uh, related question. Um, this is long. So, <laughs> do any of the states profiled here include partnerships with legal aid to help remove obstacles to jobs, like legal assistance to expunge criminal records, to reinstate revoked driver's license? Uh, I guess new language in the WIOA rule expressly allows and encourages legal aid. So. I, uh, Maryland can take a stab at that. Uh, as you, many folks around the country may recall, during the Baltimore unrest in April of 2015, uh, one of the uh, results of that was uh, the U.S. Department of Labor uh, giving us the opportunity to apply for a demonstration grant. It was a $5 million demonstration grant uh, that went to 12 uh, entities in Baltimore City and a key part of that, that demonstration grant was that every individual that enrolled in one of the programs through the 12 entities uh, that were providing services, everyone got a, a, a legal check. In other words, part of the program was every individual enrollment um, would receive a one-on-one, -on -one, face to face visit with an attorney to address all of their different barriers. So it's not just that they're in Excel and that's one barrier. They may have parking tickets that have accrued fines for the last five years while they were in prison. They may have uh, child custody issues. They may have a whole host of legal in, uh, issues. So one of the uh, key parts of the demonstration grant was to say, okay, individuals with barriers, uh, they need to meet with an attorney. Likewise, we've been approached by, and I'm going to get the name of the organization, but basically our Legal Aid Bureau and we are launching in two other areas because of the success of providing those legal checkups in Baltimore City, we're expanding that to two others of our local WIOA areas. And the Legal Aid Bureau is actually doing that free of charge to the system. So we will be providing an opportunity in two additional areas around the state for individuals to meet one-on-one -on -one, uh, with an attorney and look at, at the issues that they have that they need to get corrected that are preventing them from getting employment. And I'd like to mention that the Justice Center is developing a comprehensive website about record clearance and will be training um, legal aid staff across the country about how to use it. It'll also be 
accessible to people that need their records cleared. And that will be um, launched in September. Um, we have another question, I think, related to the Maryland EARN program. Um, it's um, basically, I guess the question is, so the applicants are trainees. So I guess in the, er in the EARN program, are trainees the employers or the community colleges or industry associations and unions or all of the above? <laughs> It can be all of the above. Again, the secret sauce is that you have a minimum of five business employers, you have a training provider, and you have a pipeline for people to train that may come from uh, various backgrounds. In other words, a particular applicant may be a nonprofit organization that specializes in uh, returning citizens, uh, ex-offenders. So you have the ex-offender population, you have the nonprofit that serves them that's going to provide the training, and then you have the businesses that agree that, yes, we need this pipeline of welders or we need this pipeline on hospitality or construction. Uh, so it's really those three pieces. Uh, the applicants are the nonprofit organization or the community college. Uh, we purposely left it very, very vague and, and didn't fully specify who the applicant would be because we really want to push uh, innovation. We didn't limit it to community colleges or didn't limit it to certain 501c3s. We left it wide open, um, but you have to have those three components in order to get funded. I'm going to have to cut off the questions because it's been an hour and we are out of time. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters. Uh, it's been very informative, and uh, you can tell there's a lot of answers because we didn't get to answer all the questions. <laughs> um, I just want to remind everyone that we will be sending a link to the webinar, so you can, it will be recorded, so you can watch it again later. If you have colleagues who are unable to watch it, they can watch it later. And also, we'll be sending a link to download the slides. So just to point you to the uh, website, it's the uh, CSG Knowledge Center at csg.org. And uh, you can also go there to look at future events in our eAcademy series, that um, there are workforce events and other areas, education, fiscal, finance, transportation, any area that would affect a state government. Um, I'm Donna Counts at CSG Headquarters in Lexington. Thank you again for all our participants and for our attendees. Have a good afternoon.